Welcome back, everybody. Today we're going to play around a bit more with Stokes' theorem. Uh, last time uh, we saw the statement of this result and uh, talked about how it really says the same thing as Green's theorem, uh, but now instead of just a region in the plane, uh, we're looking at a surface in space. All right, but Stokes' theorem tells us uh, we can do two things, and then we're going to get the same result. Um, the situation is that we have a vector field. All right, so we have all these green vectors attached to each and every point in space and on and off our surface. And the line integral on the right is us uh, moving around our outside curve and uh, computing the circulation of our vector field there, right? Just adding up our tangential components as we move along that boundary curve. On the left, right, this is playing the part of going through our surface and um, adding up the circulation at each point. Right? The idea is that uh, attached to each point in three space, right, we have a curl vector, right? the curl of our vector field. Right, with by the right hand rule shows us how our uh, kind of fluid is circulating there and uh, we can go through the service integral and add up the normal components of our curl vectors right so here this would be the normal components of that one and we can go through um, in this normal direction and add up all of that information the normal components of the curl. And Stokes' theorem tells us that we'll get the same thing as long as our surface and our curve are oriented positively. All right? They need to be working in harmony. Recall the idea is that when we look down on our surface from above, so looking down right, towards our normal vectors uh, that we're moving counterclockwise around our boundary curve. Right? Or the other way was uh, imagine our thumb sticking up in the normal direction. And the right hand rule will tell us what direction we want to be moving around our curve so that these will match up. We went through an example where we took a surface integral last time and with Stokes theorem swapped it out for the line integral around its boundary. We played a little game and we saw that curl fields are independent of surface. And as long as they have the same boundary with the correct orientation, doesn't matter what surface you integrate over, you'll get the same thing. Today, uh, we're going to work through one example, but going the other direction, taking a line integral and through Stokes' theorem, swapping it out for a surface integral. Let's start in. All right, so let's let C be the intersection of the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals 9 with the plane y plus c equals 3. And so let's actually, um, let's pause there and, and uh, take a look at this uh, picture to kind of get oriented here. No pun intended. All right. So let's see. Our cylinder, right? Well, in the, in the x, y plane, right? This is just the uh, circle of radius 3, but in 3 space now, because there's no z, right, this is going to extend um, vertically up and down perfectly, and we'll get our 
uh, circular cylinder that we see here. All right, so here is our x squared plus y squared equals 9 cylinder. And then we also have a plane, uh, y plus z equals 3. And here there's actually no x. And so if we want to get a sense of what this looks like, we can first draw it in the yz plane right, as uh, z equals 3 minus y. And so this is going to be a, a line like this, right? Y, a z intercept, I guess, 3 and slope negative 1. All right, and so here in the yz plane, uh, we can see the kind of connection here at 3 on the z axis and 3 on the y. Right, and so here's that kind of, if I drew it in here, I'm, 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 let me draw it in and then I'll erase it. All right, this would be the line that we drew here. And we're going to extend that in the x direction, forwards and backwards, perfectly. Um, and we get our plane here. All right, so here's our plane. y plus z equals 3. And so our plane, this slanted plane here, is kachowing through our cylinder, and we end up with this curve as the intersection. So this kind of slanted oval type shape. That's our curve we're looking at. All right, so moving back up to the statement, we want to use Stokes' theorem to compute this line integral of a vector field, where our vector field is what's here, and right, we need to know which direction to move around our curve C. C is oriented counterclockwise when viewed from above. And so above here, this is just talking about the, you know, the z-axis. So here we're looking down and uh, moving counterclockwise then is going to be moving us in this direction. All right, so we're going to be <clears throat> moving along uh, this direction along our curve and integrating, if we were to compute this line integral, are the tangential components of these green vectors all over the place that we can't see. All right. But how do we use Stokes' theorem to do this? Well, Stokes' theorem says this line integral we can swap out for the surface integral of the curl of f. And that's really the only place where we use Stokes' theorem. Uh, Stokes' theorem allows us to make this swap. And now at this point, this surface integral on the right, uh, this really becomes our world. In the sense that this is all we have to think about now. Uh, now that we've used Stokes' theorem to swap this out, uh, we just need to figure out the pieces that we need to compute this surface integral for this vector field, the curl of f. I'm going to take us a couple steps closer. And um, at a certain point, um, I'm going to hand things off to you all to work through the rest of it. But let, let's start in. All right, so first of all, um, what is our S here? Well, uh, from Stokes' theorem, S is um, a surface with our curve as its boundary. All right, well, what curve, what surface, rather, uh, do we want to use that has our curve as its boundary? Well, there's kind of two surfaces going on. Um, the cylinder is going to be awkward since it doesn't really close up on the bottom. It just goes down infinitely. Uh, I think a much more clean choice is to use the plane, to use the portion of the plane uh, 
that's in between our kind of oval shaped curve here. And so let's choose that as our surface S. All right, notice just what I've shaded in in blue here. Uh, we do get our curve C as its boundary. And right away, let's just think about the positive orientation here uh, for our surface. In order for the right hand rule uh, to give us this direction, we want to move around our curve. All right, the question is, do we want to point our normal vectors sticking you know, downward or upward from our surface? And it's going to be upward, right? This is going to give us, through the right hand rule, uh, the correct uh, the correct orientation moving around our boundary curve there, right? So we have all these normal vectors uh, pointing this direction, and that's how our surface is oriented. All right. So now that we know what our surface is. Uh, in order to compute our surface integral, we have our same two steps as we would for any other surface integral. All right, first stop is parameterize our surface. And here, even though um, our surface is kind of this oval, circularish shape, um, what's going to be cleanest to do is to use rectangular coordinates. Uh, use rectangular coordinates to set up our parameterization, then we'll translate our integral, and then eventually later on switch to polar. But it's going to help us with our differentiation and cross products and stuff like that. If we use rectangular, things will be cleaner. And so here's our here's our thought. Looking at the surface, we need to parameterize in blue here. Well, this is actually just a portion of a plane, right? y plus z equals 3. And if we'd like, like we did before, we could solve this for z equals 3 minus y. And so our surface is actually a function of, you know, x and y. And so this uh, 3 minus y, uh, we can just take in, in our parameterization, right, which needs to be spitting us out the x, y, z points right, on our surface. Right, We want to move through our entire surface. We can just take this and plop that in for z. And we get our vector function. And so our parameters here are x and y. We just need to know our parameterization domain. And uh, looking at our picture here, it's just going to be this shadow right inside I'm going to not do it the same color. Um, like this. It's going to be this shadow, yeah? Um, our circle of radius 3 in the xy plane. Right? Those are going to be the xy's, xy's that we use to get our surface here, this slanted oval. And so uh, since we're going to be translating the polar later, let's just kind of uh, succinctly describe these as all the points with x squared plus y squared less than or equal to 9. Right? Equal to 9 are the points on the boundary of this circle, and the less than allows it to be all the inside stuff as well. And so with that, step one is complete. We have our parameterization. And now we can use it to translate our surface integral. All right, so now to translate our integral, we recall that what we're actually integrating is a vector field, right? We use our translation formula. All right, we don't need to know the size of the cross product here. Um, things cancel off nicely, and this is the formula that we've seen before. Right, we have our vector field, right, dot, dotted with the 
cross product of the partial derivatives of our parametrization right, over our parametrization domain. And, and before we start in, we got to figure out what order we want these, right? UV, VU, and really for us, right? Um, U and V are, you know, X and Y. But we need to know, uh, do we want RX cross RY or RY cross RX? We need to figure out the order. And this comes from finding the order that'll make that partial derivative match our normal vectors on our surface. All right, and it really comes from drawing. All right, we want to draw the partial derivative vectors rx and ry on our original picture. So let's scroll up and take care of that. Okay, so planting ourselves, say, at this point right here. What color do I want to do this in? That's very important question. I'll just stick with gold. Okay. To draw the partial derivative vector rx, we want to imagine what direction we would move if starting from this point, we just cranked up our x coordinates a little bit. Right? And so starting from this point, moving on our surface, our blue surface, if we move our x coordinate, right, well, that's just going to take us in you know, positive x direction. That's just going to move us this way. All right, so right there, there's our rx sketch. Now, what about starting from the same point again, if we moved our y coordinate up? Right, while still moving along the surface, right? We want to move y in the positive direction, but moving along the surface is going to kind of take us downward like this. So here's our picture of the partial ry. And now we just need to stick out our right hand and figure out, is it rx cross ry that points our thumb in this normal direction? Or is it ry cross rx? Okay, and it's rx cross ry. I'm trying to draw a right hand. Not sure if that's coming through. <laughs> But, right, if you imagine pointing our fingers in the Rx direction, curling them to the Ry, yeah, our thumb's going to be pointing up. So scrolling back down to our integral, we see that it's Rx cross Ry that we want. And with that, we really have um, two things that we need to figure out to work through our integral. Right, the first is this cross product, right? That's our Rx cross Ry. We need to figure that out. We also need to figure out what the curl of our vector field is. Once we have those two pieces, this cross product and this curl, we can dot product them and we'll know exactly what we're integrating. All right, at this point, I'm gonna hand things over to you Pause the video, take some time, see if you can compute these two ingredients here, set up your integral, and compute away. All right, well, let's walk through the rest of this. Uh, so taking the partial of our parametrization, let's see if I can scroll up. Can I get it all the same screen? A little bit. Zoom out. All right, so with respect to x, we're going to get uh, 1, 0, 0. 
and our partial with respect to y is going to be 0, 1, negative 1. And so here are our two partial derivative vectors. And we're going to take their cross product, just like we would any other two vectors. Right? And uh, here's what I get. Uh, working through that cross product, right, the first component is 0 times minus 1, minus 0 times 1, so 0 minus 0. And similarly, moving through the other two components, we wind up with 0, 1, 1 as our cross product. All right, so that's ingredient one. Good to go. Ingredient two, the curl of our vector field. You should remember how to compute the curl of something. And so this is our del cross our vector field. And so we just have another cross product to compute, really, where del is, right, this vector with uh, del del x, del del y, del del z. And really for the first time in our computation here, um, our vector field f is coming in. All right, so here's the vector field f that we saw at the very beginning of the example. And we just need to take the cross product here as we would any other cross product. So if we, for, for the first entry, right, forget the first column, the partial with respect to y of z squared is zero, minus the partial with respect to z of x is zero. In the middle component, the partial with respect to x of z squared is zero, minus the partial with respect to z of negative y squared is zero. So zero minus zero in the middle. And for our last component, we actually get something. So forgetting the last column here, partial with respect to x of x is 1, minus the partial with respect to y of negative y squared, which gives us 1 minus negative 2y, or 1 plus 2y as our z component. And with that, we know what the curl of our vector field is. So we have our second ingredient. We can now mix these two together as our formula instructs us. And so we just need to slap them in where they go. So here's our curl. And our cross product, our x cross our y. And we can just take their uh, dot product as we would any other two vectors. All right, multiply the x components, uh, the y components, and the z components, and add those up. We're going to get 0 plus 0 plus 1 plus 2y. And so here is the information that we're actually integrating over our parameterization domain, d. Right now. Up top, we did this in green, so I'll stick with that. All right here is our parameterization domain. And if you recall, our parameterization domain is our disk, right? Our disk of radius three underneath our slanted oval. And so at this point, very natural to switch over to polar for a clean uh, description of our parameterization domain here. All right, so we'll switch to polar uh, for x and y, so our standard polar coordinates and equations we'll use. And with that, right, our description of our parameterization domain, just r from 0 to 3, theta from 0 to 2 pi, and then we have 1 plus 2, right, and y becomes r sine theta, and as always, dA is r dr d theta. All right. So at this point, we have our integral fully set up, limits of integration and everything. Uh, we can go ahead and uh, crank through this integral. I'll leave the details for you. We work through that. We get down to 9 pi as our final result. All right, so that's how it can feel 
uh, to use Stokes' theorem to take a line integral and swap it out for surface integral of a curl field. Good work today, everybody. I'll see you next time.